Welcome to Contracts. I'm so excited to be your instructor. I'd like to spend maybe an hour or an hour and a half with you uh, going over some <clears throat> uh, procedural matters. I apologize in advance. This is going to be a little bit dry, but unfortunately there's not uh, a lot of better ways to present this information. Before we start, I'm going to suggest that you have a notepad and a paper, excuse me, a pencil or a pen handy. Um, if you don't have those yet, go ahead and pause me and get those uh, with you so that you can make the most of your time. I'm going to be sharing a lot of stuff with you, and it's just not realistic that you're going to be able to commit those to memory, having heard them once. But if you go ahead and write them down, then you'll have it available to you for reflection and review at later points in the semester. You may, I'm going to be talking about things uh, go all the way to the final examination today, and um, in December, you're probably not going to remember too much of what we talked about today in August. So <clears throat> please go ahead and, and take some careful notes as we proceed. Throughout this lecture, feel free to pause me. If I say something too quickly and you need to kind of catch up with your notes, don't hesitate to pause me. Or let's say you need to hear something twice. Go ahead and pause me and, and listen to me again. Alternatively, and I think this is probably going to be true, um, you may not want to sit for 90 minutes and listen to this lecture. I completely get that. Um, you may want to break this down into 20 or 30 minute segments. Listen to me for a while, then take a break and do something else and then come back and finish up. Those are smart strategies. That's going to increase um, the uh, retention that you're going to have. And it's also going to make it a less awful process to begin with. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is how your canvas will look for the most part. I won't have this fuchsia line down here, but otherwise it'll look very similar. The lecture that um, I'm recording right now will be right here. It'll be under instructor Professor Groover, but before the PowerPoint. Um, this, as you can see, is called Start Here Orientation. Welcome. Um, and so that's where you'll be starting for this first week. Um, below this, I'm going to close this here. Below this, you're going to find some study aids, which we'll talk about in a second, some legal writing materials. And then when you see chapter one, that's when the, the nitty gritty, the guts of the course begin. We're actually covering substantive material and we'll be talking about this in more detail as well but we're going to be spending a lot of time up here in these first three modules so let's get started you can see that the first item underneath the course name and my name is the PowerPoint and so we're going to spend some time going over that we're also going to talk about the syllabus and I'll open that in a few minutes so you can see though that there's several other things here that we'll be spending time on that's why it takes so long to get through all the material so let's get started with the PowerPoint I've already downloaded it to save us a few seconds of time and so <clears throat> here we go um, first of all I want to be sure that you feel welcome this course, I hope, will be awesome and wonderful and uh, you, that you learn a lot of material that you will use in your professional life. I also hope that you'll find it interesting. I find contract law very, very interesting. And so hopefully, I'm not the only person who feels that way about the course, um, but I'm, I'm very excited to be teaching it and to getting to know each and every one of you. Some of y'all I've, I've checked and I actually have had you in other classes. A few of y'all I haven't had before. And so it's especially exciting for me to have the opportunity to meet new people and hear about their journey and be of a value to them as they progress in their legal career. This is me. Um, I am your instructor. If you haven't met me before and you see me, say so you see this face on campus, you can connect that with me. Um, I uh, have uh, been at Collin for about 10 years. Prior to that, I practiced law for about 20 years. I practiced at a large law firm in Houston, and then I went in-house, meaning I went to work for a corporation, JCPenney, in Plano, um, and was there for um, almost, well, actually, 17 years. So I was there for quite a while. I primarily practiced labor and employment law, but I was also a litigator. Um, in my uh, career as a labor and employment attorney, I wrote lots and lots of contracts, many of them employment contracts, but more often they were settlement agreements. So I have some professional experience with contract drafting, although I wouldn't say that was my major focus of my career. Um, <clears throat> I am the discipline lead for the paralegal studies. I flag this because um, 
there are certain administrative things that you may find that I can help with above and beyond just being your instructor. For example, let's say you have questions about course order or what electives to take or things along those lines. You're welcome to talk to any faculty member. Um, I encourage you to do so, but I am especially well positioned to give you that information. And so please don't hesitate to reach out to me with those types of questions or concerns and I will be glad to assist you. I teach outside the paralegal program as well. I teach a business law, which is a course for business majors. By the way, the, even though the name, all the, these courses names may sound like they would be a good fit for paralegalism, um, these courses don't transfer into our program. That doesn't mean they can't be valuable for you to take from a professional development standpoint, but unfortunately I won't be able to treat those as electives. So um, consider taking these if, if you would like, and I hope that you you if, if they are a hat, do add value that you will go ahead and sign up for them, but just know that they won't be part of the paralegal program. So business law is just what the title suggests. It's for <clears throat> business majors. It's kind of an introduction. I'll be honest with you. It's a lot more basic than the stuff that we teach in the paralegal program. Um, so you, if you were to ever take it, you would feel very confident going into that class because you know much, much of the content already. Hospitality law is for a course for uh, hospitality managers. Much of it is like business law, but there are some uh, unique issues relating to the hospitality industry. For example, we talk about <clears throat> um, alcohol rules, how you, when you can serve alcohol, when you can't, things along those lines. We also talk about uh, hy hygienic practices with respect to food and things along those lines. So there's some um, industry specific things that we chat about in that class. And then finally, we have employment practices. I don't like the name of this course. To me, it's not very descriptive. What it really is, is employment law for HR professionals. Um, we actually have an employment law course in Collin. I am in the process of developing that as an online course. I am hoping, knock on wood, to be able to teach it as an online course next fall. There's a fair amount of bureaucracy associated with getting an online course going here at Collin, and so I don't think I can do it before then. Um, if you take it in the fall, then that would be an elective course. Um, if you happen to choose to take employment practices with me, um, that would be great, but I won't be able to count that as an elective for the paralegal program. Um, let's go forward from here. My office is on the Preston Ridge campus here in Frisco, and I am in the library building on the second floor. My office faces the quad. Um, I have a really nice office. I'm very pleased with it, <clears throat> but I don't spend a lot of time in that office aside from my office hours. Um, I work primarily from home if I'm not in the classroom or in my office hours. Um, I've got kids and family stuff and so it's just more convenient for me but of course if something comes up outside of my office hours and we need to meet I'll be glad to meet with you there and during my office hours this is where you'll find me um, I provide a lot of assistance to for associates certainly course specific assistance but really because we're a workforce program I provide a lot of career guidance resume help things along those lines so I uh, think of me as a as a more expansive resource than perhaps your average instructor in your average course all of the information about my office hours is in the syllabus we'll get to that in a few minutes this is the textbook. Um, if you go to the Collin Bookstore, they will have the latest and greatest edition. Um, nothing in the world wrong with, with getting the latest, latest edition, but uh, earlier editions will also work. Uh, the page numbers might be off a little bit, but that can be a very good resource. Uh, there's no particular reason you have to buy the latest edition. Another strategy you may want to consider is renting a book, a paper version of the book, or even renting an electronic version. Those can be cheaper ways of managing the cost. Finally, you're welcome to share a book with one or more students. Um, we don't have open book open notes or open book tests in this class, so um, as long as you can work out some schedule with somebody, there's no real reason why you can't share a textbook with somebody else. I know textbook costs are some of the most ex most expensive part of the paralegal program. We are constantly working to reduce those and we have uh, plans afoot to do that, um, but we, uh, we haven't been able to do that yet in contracts. So we want to uh, make this as, as, as inexpensive as, as you can, as we can. Another option would be to borrow my textbook during my office hours. I am glad to do that. I have 
about uh, two or th I guess about, about two or three hours of face-to-face uh, uh, -face, um, office hours this uh, semester. If you let me know that you want to borrow the textbook during those hours, I would be glad to let you uh, borrow, borrow them at that time. Just let me know in advance because many times I actually have the textbooks at home since that's primarily where I work. And so I'll need to remember to bring them to the office. Um, we, this course, if you've taken other online courses, um, this is going to be a pretty dramatically different experience for you, probably, in that we try to replicate the face-to-face uh, -face class experience in an online environment. I will have pretty much the same lectures that I would have offered in class in this course. Of course, they'll be taped. They won't be face-to-face -face experiences. You won't be able to raise your hand and ask a question, for example. I won't be able to canvas the class and ask questions. So it won't be exactly the same, but in terms of the content, it will be the same. You'll be looking at the same PowerPoints I would have used in class. I'll be using the same silly stories that I use in class. All that kind of stuff will be exactly the same. You need to watch the lectures. I want you to read the textbook and watch the lectures, but if you have to choose, watch the lectures. Um, that is going to be your most uh, helpful resource in being successful on the tests. Um, and and uh, so I, I want to emphasize that, and as we go farther into this presentation, you'll find out uh, why it's even more important that you watch the lectures in this course versus other courses. But please don't consider this an option. Um, and the lectures take a while to, to watch. You know, you, you can maybe skim a chapter in a textbook in 15 or 20 minutes, but it's kind of hard to skim a lecture. So be sure to set aside a time. You may even want to treat this as a scheduled class time. Um, it might be, you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning, but you still you may want to go ahead and schedule it so you can have an appointment with yourself to watch these videos. One of the nice things about watching video, uh, video lectures is that you can pause me whenever you want to. You can uh, either to take notes or to uh, grab something to eat or whatever you want to do. You can also do it whenever you want. You can do it in your jammies if you want. Um, you can watch me more than once. You can fast forward me through portions. I even heard of friends who've uh, come up with drinking games <laughs> when they're watching me. You know, every time Gruber says contracts, you know, or something along those lines. Um, uh, all of those are options. You obviously don't have to do those things, but uh, you may want to take advantage of the special circumstances that um, tape lectures might provide. Another thing you may want to do is listen to my lectures. You can download them as audio files. If you need help with that, let me know. And that way, when you're in the car and driving around, you can listen to the lecture a second time. I don't encourage that you do that the first time because obviously you can't take notes during um, that. And um, I don't, you should you obviously don't want to be distracted when you're driving, but that can be a, maybe a second time through approach. Please spend a little bit of time going through Canvas. There's a couple of interesting twists, so to speak, to our Canvas site that you may not have seen before. I'll talk about them here, but I think it's a good idea to kind of dive in and explore, click on things, see what happens. Um, in my opinion, that's a better, more effective way of learning than me telling you about the various aspects. I uh, already showed you where to begin with the orientation material. There is an orientation quiz, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So please do take this material seriously so that you can be successful in the course and also be successful on the quiz. Here's some information about Canvas. If you don't have a lot of exposure to Canvas, this is a good tool to get you started. Um, when you, If this is your first online course, you may have had just a little bit of exposure to Canvas in your other courses. And so this can be a good way to uh, deepen your knowledge of that tool. Please, please, please read your syllabus and also the announcements. Um, in face-to-face -face classes, sometimes I use announcements pretty significantly, sometimes I don't. But in an online course, I mean, they're the lifeline between us. Um, so please be on the lookout for that. When I send announcements, there will be two ways that you can read them. One is that they will go to your uh, Cougar Mail um, email address, and if you look at that regularly, then you're covered. But some students don't choose to use that tool as much as maybe their personal email address, so they may not notice when that announcement goes to their Cougar Mail. That's okay because the announcements will also post in Canvas, and I'll show you where you can find those. Um, <clears throat> 
I get a lot of questions, especially in online courses about, well, what's the due date here? Or how can I do this? Or I don't get where to find this or whatever the particular thing is. Uh, conservatively, 90% of those questions you're going to be able to find either in the syllabus or in the orientation folder. So please just do a check there. Uh, I don't want you to feel embarrassed when I say, oh, well, you know what? That was actually in the syllabus. Um, and so if you can invest just a few minutes, and again, your notes here from this lecture will probably give you all the answers you need. But if your notes maybe might have missed that, or maybe I failed to say that particular item, know that almost always those questions will be answerable on Canvas. If you really, really can't find the answer, of course, reach out to me. And then probably I will schedule a time that you and I can talk, and I will show you where to find that information so that you'll have that resource available to you going forward. Um, we will um, have kind of a combination of things in this course in terms of, of due dates. Um, we'll talk more about due dates later on. But um, an important thing to keep in mind is I do not accept late submissions for credit. Um, so that won't be an option. Um, it's not that I don't think that you're lying to me if you say something unfortunate happened. It's just that there's plenty of time in this course to get everything done well in advance. And so I encourage you to work ahead and get things done. Um, and so uh, the fact that your computer went down on Saturday and Sunday and you weren't able to do that um, doesn't answer the question of, well, why didn't you do it on the Friday or the Thursday before? Or why didn't you go to the computer lab? Um, you can ask for extensions, but just know the answer is always going to be no. And um, it does create a certain level of awkwardness. And so I, I would ask that you uh, think before you send that note. Um, if you feel like your circumstances are truly, truly extraordinary, um, you know, reach out to me knowing that very, very likely the answer will still be no. Of course, you can always work ahead. And if there is something that you want to do early that you can't do, that's something you absolutely can raise with me. For example, let's say you want to take the midterm before the window that I've established. Usually I can accommodate doing things earlier type requests. And so please do feel free to reach out to me and um, I'll be glad to consider that request. You wanna visit the course at least twice a week. And I'm gonna ask that you do it by Tuesday. One of the reasons it's so good for you to visit early in the week is so that you can do that first discussion board post in weeks that we do have a discussion board. Um, because, uh, because you'll have to make a substantive post and a reply post. Well, it's hard to make a reply post if nobody's made their substantive post yet. So uh, that's an important part. If we get people doing their substantive posts by Tuesday or Wednesday, then there's lots of things to reply to. So you're actually, by visiting earlier, you're, you're assisting your, your colleagues in the class in being able to complete their assignments for the week. Um, now, you don't have to do it by Tuesday, but you do need to make that first post by noon on Saturday. If you miss this deadline, you can still make it, but you won't receive all the points for this submission. I am not a big person for reminding about deadlines. Um, I um, don't do that for a couple of reasons. One's just really practical. Um, I typically teach seven courses and so um, I sometimes forget when a deadline is coming up since I'm not actually submitting the assignment and if I start reminding people about deadlines and I fail to remind you for one I've kind of lulled you into a sense that well Gruber's always going to remind me so I don't have to worry about it. That's one reason. The second reason is that I mean you and you're an adult I'm an adult it's kind of a little bit offensive in my opinion for adults to be treating other adults as if one of the one of us isn't an adult. I don't want to patronize you or offend you in that way. And honestly, I kind of would be offended. Maybe offended is too strong, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't take nicely to an instructor acting as if I don't know how to put dates on a calendar. And so I don't want to put you in a position where you feel like I'm not treating you with with respect and not treating you as an adult. That's the second reason. The third reason is that in this profession that we've chosen. Dates are huge. Um, courts don't give extensions. Almost never do they give extensions. And so if you miss the deadline, you and your client are in a world of hurt. 
And in the real world, in the legal world, uh, deadlines aren't given to you. If you need, for example, if you need to reply to a motion, nobody's calling you up and say, okay, just so you'll know your reply is due on this date. No, you have to check the rule. You have to do the number crunching to figure out when that date is. And if you miscalculate and send it in too late, you are not going to be considered, that document's not going to be considered. So while I will give you due dates, I'm not going to say it's due 10 days from whatever, um, you will have those dates available to you. Uh, just keep in mind that this is training for your career, for the expectations that will exist. Um, I like to tell people that it's much, that this is kind of a, a, a gentler way of getting used to the real world. If you talk to very many legal professionals who've been out there for very long, um, I, in my experience, most, probably virtually all of them will be, will have a story. They may not share it with you, but they'll have a story where they missed a deadline. Um, I have a story. In my example, it worked out okay, but there were, uh, I would say, weeks of sleepless nights over it, um, and it could have not worked out okay. So, um, this uh, missing a deadline here and learning the lesson when uh, your employment isn't in jeopardy, when uh, no client is going to be adversely impacted, this is the time to miss a deadline. And if you miss a deadline and get a zero, that's probably a good training moment for I never want to be in this position again. And that may well help you avoid that in your professional life. So consider it like a vaccination almost against that particular problem. Please do contact me. Uh, if I haven't met you before, I would love to get sit down with you and talk. Just come by to chit chat. Um, if we already know each other, also come by and chit chat. Um, I have virtual office hours, meaning that we can talk via uh, a telephone or via computer if you aren't able to come into my office. Um, I would be glad to sit down and chat with you about your goals and aspirations and your academic pr progress as well as uh, more practical things like resumes and things like that. Um, this is my email address right here. It's my first initial, my last name, at colin.edu. If you need to reach out to me electronically, this is the way to do it. Let me just show you something else. Yeah. Again, this is our website. You may notice over here that there is this box. It's called Inbox. It is so tempting to click on that box. I completely get while you are doing stuff in a class, you might look over and go, oh, I've got a question for Gruber. Well, let me just click on this box. I understand the temptation, but please, please don't. Um, the main reason that I ask that you don't do it is that I don't check this box. Um, it could well be that I don't even see that I have a message there because I don't use it. I use email exclusively. The reason that I use email is that most of my students I have from more than one class. This box is going to organize you by a particular class. Let's say that you're in one of my classes two semesters from now, and you raise an issue, and I'm thinking, well, let me see what Bob and I dis discussed about that issue in the past. Well, now I have to remember what course Bob was in in mine and what semester it was. As soon as I teach more than one section of a course, so then I might have to remember what section he was in. That's a lot of work to get to that answer. But if Bob sent me an email, then I will have already organized Bob's in my communication and email folder. Let's say Bob's last name is Brown. Well, he'll be in my B folder. So it'll be an easy uh, process for me to do that. I, I open that folder. I have the, the, the people involved in that organized alphabetically. It takes me almost no time to find all of my correspondence with Bob. So you can see how I won't even think about looking here historically. Now, there's nothing wrong with this program. I'm not criticizing at all. Um, other faculty members may want you to use this tool. Um, if I could make this tool go away on my campus, I absolutely would, but unfortunately, I can't. So I just want to flag that for you. Don't use this. If you send me an email here, it's like it never even happened. Go ahead and send me an email the traditional way. Okay, I've gotten off my soapbox there. Um, 
Let's talk about emails. I get a lot of emails from students naturally. That's a good thing. Um, and sometimes I get very nicely written emails, but more often than not, I get emails that aren't kind of ready for prime time. Um, and one of the reasons why, I, well, there's actually two reasons, well, I'll say three reasons why I flag this. Um, but the most important reason I flag it is that if you're sending me very informal, casually written emails, my guess is that you're probably doing similar things at work. And that is not a smart professional strategy. Now, it may be that you're being sloppy with me and you're doing very, very great things at work, and so I, there's nothing for us to worry about. You're on the track. But um, in the event that that's not the case, I want you to leave this program knowing how to write a professional email and doing that on a routine basis. Honestly, it's not much harder to write a professional email than it is to write a informal, uh, sloppy email. And you have to check spelling and things like that a little bit, so it does take a bit more effort. But it becomes a practice, a habit that you don't even have to think about. And so I'm going to go through right now some of those mechanics. We cover these in more detail in other courses, so um, this will be material that you'll hear again and again. The first part, uh, let's first of all talk about why, why, do, why, why should you care about this? Well, of course, in a professional situation, people are making judgments about you based upon your emails all the time. Um, I just had somebody at the college say to me uh, yesterday, oh, your emails are so great. They are so well written and they communicate exactly what I need. Thank you so much for that. Um, that's what you want. You want to be that person who sends those great emails because guess what? People notice. But probably more than they notice the great emails is they notice the bad emails. And if you're the person who sends the incomprehensible, poorly written, sloppy emails, you're going to be known for that. And it's not a good thing. They may never say to you, oh, yeah, you write awful emails. But you know what? You have... Uh, uh, limit, li limited the horizon for your career by engaging in that behavior. So it's really out of self-interest that you want to write careful professional emails um, because you're going to have a reputation that is going to be developed because of your strong emails. And but more, maybe even more important than that is that an effective email actually accomplishes what you want the email to do. An ineffective email oftentimes uh, results in you spending more time than if you had written the careful email. So let's go through some of the things about emails that are uh, very, very helpful for you to do. On your subject line, you want to include two things in a, in a course. Number one, you want to identify the course that you're in. I happen to be teaching only one contracts course this time, so it's fine to say contracts or LGLA 1351. If I happen to have been teaching two sections of contracts, then you ought to specify which particular section that it's in. You may not know whether your instructor is teaching more than one section at a particular time, so it's probably a good idea usually to include the section. You don't have to give the official section number. You could say the online version or uh, the version that meets on Tuesdays at 10 or whatever the, the item is. You want to identify that because the faculty member may not remember which particular class you're in. Maybe you were in uh, her bankruptcy class last semester, and so she's thinking bankruptcy instead of contracts or whatever it is. So this is helping the instructor figure out who you are and what, where, what particular subject matter uh, you ought to be talking about. And then you also want to include in that subject line the specifics of your question. A question about chapter 10 assignment question 14 LGLA 1351 you want to include this as well as your subject because um, another class might be on chapter 10 and maybe that's the uh, civil litigation chapter that the class is on and so saying chapter 10 doesn't tell the reader exactly what um, is going on so you want to include a subject line that is pretty precise and also includes the course. Okay, so why do you want it to be pretty precise? Well, some subjects make it very clear, hey, this is an urgent situation. For example, let's say we're on the final day of the midterm being available and uh, 
Canvas isn't working. You cannot get in to take this test. Well, that's a pretty big crisis. I mean, the, 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 the time is going to end and you haven't taken the test and Gruber doesn't let me do things later on. So I've got a couple hours to figure this out. If I don't have a subject line that is compelling, Gruber maybe will say, okay, well, I'll just worry about that tomorrow. Well, tomorrow's not going to be working for this particular student. So it communicates the urgency of the matter. Um, it also lets the, um, the faculty member organize this. For example, let's say by looking at the subject line, the faculty member has three questions on the same issue. Well, that lets him or her know, wait a second, <laughs> gosh, uh, something's going on here. Uh, I probably need to, to figure out what this problem is. This isn't just a student who's not understanding the assignment. Probably I've done something wrong under those circumstances. So it communicates valuable information. Finally, it helps the faculty member file this particular item uh, so that, uh, or, or be able to, to search that item later on. So those are some helpful uh, takeaways from the subject line. How would you translate this in the professional situation? Well, in the professional situation, instead of listing a course, of course, <laughs> you're going to list a matter number. Let's say it's uh, Bob Green's will that you're working on, and that matter in your firm is Green-004. Well, that you'd want to include that matter number. It's going to allow you to file that document pretty easily. And then you'd want to include some additional information. Let's say you're sending this email to Mr. Green and you want to get some information about um, where a certain property that he has, what counties they're in. And so you might say something like need a county location for property in West Texas. That communicates to Bob what he needs to find for you. After you do that, your subject line, you're going to want to start your email with a greeting. Um, now, if you're sending an email to your significant other, you're not going to say, you know, dear Miss Brown or dear Mr. Smith. Um, but when you are sending it in a professional situation, you are going to want to start with dear, uh, some kind of honorific such as Mr., Dr., Ms., in my case, professor, uh, the surname, and then a colon. That's the standard way of doing these emails. Now, if it's someone you work with every day, you're probably going to say, Dear Bob, colon. Uh, but it's better to err on the side of formality than not. And so it's never going to offend somebody to say, Dear Mr. Green, instead of Dear Harry. Um, Dear Harry might occasionally offend. Um, just be sure to always conclude with the colon. The colon is the signal to the reader this is a professional communication. This isn't personal. Now, if you, uh, if, if Harry is your client, but you're also, he's also your buddy and you're all going to grab lunch, you might do a comma. And that's going to communicate to Harry, okay, wait a second, this isn't professional. This is a, a friendship email that's happening here. But in our context, we're going to use the colon. Um, You'll see some of those people in emails will say, hi, Professor Groover, hey, Professor Groover, good morning, Professor Groover. Those aren't terrible, but there's no reason to vary it. This is a formula that's tried and true. It's not broken, so there's no need to fix it. Let's stay with dear Professor Groover. If you want to write out professor, you can, but you don't have to. Um, it is true that all attorneys have doctorates. We have what's called a Juris Doctorate, um, but attorneys very strongly do not want to be called doctor. Uh, that is considered a uh, faux pas in the legal uh, area to do that. And so uh, please don't refer to me as Dr. Groover. I'm not going to be mad at you, but that's an, it's an embarrassing thing for an attorney to see on, on the name. And so it's better to avoid that. Um, if you don't want to call me Professor Groover, you can call me Ms. Groover if you'd like. Um, I'm fine with that as well. Um, in the body, of course, this is the main part. You want to make sure you don't need typos. You're going to write in complete sentences. Um, all of that's a given, obviously, but you're also going to want to read it to yourself because you've been dealing with a particular issue for a pretty significant amount of time before you write to me. You know, it's not something that's come up in the last two or three minutes. You will have probably looked for the answer for an hour or more and you're frustrated and you've been thinking about this a lot, but you have to keep in mind that the recipient is coming at your issue uh, without all of that experience, without all that knowledge. And so you need to introduce the subject. You want to read it to say, if I, 
was looking at this issue the first time and I read this, would I understand what's going on? Is it specific enough? Am I providing the right details? And so that is a useful path to take. If you're not sure if you're doing a good job, you may want to ask somebody else to read it. Uh, somebody who hasn't been involved in the situation can say, yep, I understand what you're saying, or no, uh, I think it, I don't understand what you're talking about in this sentence or that sentence. Again, it's helpful to clarify that. Then you're going to want a conclusion, which is usually called a valediction. A good way to conclude is sincerely. And then on the next line to include your name and your contact information. Um, your contact information should be your email address in most cases. Uh, Sometimes students will send me emails from their smartphones. They are almost always not so great. I'm going to be honest with you. There's really two problems with it. The first one is by far the more serious problem. Anyone who is typing with their thumbs isn't going to have typos, is going to have incomplete sentences. I mean, it's just the nature of the, the, the beast. Um, and so, you know, you're not, you shouldn't feel bad. That is just the way things are going to be when you're typing with your thumbs. But that's not ready for prime time. That's not ready to send to somebody in a professional context. So go ahead and compute, compose at a computer or a laptop or a Mac or a, a tablet, something that you can actually type and look at it and reread it and revise it and do a spell check and all that good stuff before you hit send. You're going to have an email that you can be proud of and that your recipient is going to say, wow, this person spent some time. They, they really wanted to be careful and uh, they wanted to show courtesy to me by sending me a responsibly and and well-prepared email, I want to return the favor to them. So um, smartphones are rarely going to meet these standards. Um, emails that you send by smartphones, unless you remove that tag at the bottom, also communicate to the recipient, hey, I didn't really bother with this. Um, I'm sending this to you quickly and uh, you know that I didn't really spend any time on it. It communicates, I don't want to say a lack of respect, but a certain level of casualness that doesn't really apply in an academic setting or professional setting. It is true you can remove that sent by a smartphone. That's a step up, admittedly, but it's probably still going to have all of those typos. And so go ahead and compose in a different means. You'll feel more proud of the document and you're likely to get a better uh, reaction from your recipient. One other thing I want to chat about is emails, and I haven't even mentioned this one yet, is that sometimes the email is not the best tool. Emails are awesome. I use them all the time. They can do tremendous things, but it's a little bit like, I don't know, if you're a surgeon and you go into the operating room, you've got lots of different scalpels, uh, scalpels for various tasks. Not every scalpel, scalpel is going to do everything for you as a surgeon. <clears throat> and so, same way, email is an awesome tool. It's a great way of communicating non-privileged, uh, clear, uncontroversial advice or information. It's also a good way to ask a very discreet, concrete question. It's bad, though, at um, communicating sensitive um, information, information. Uh, uh, emotional topics because you really can't, the, the recipient can't really interpret because uh, there isn't any t tone of voice, there isn't any body language, there aren't any facial expressions, there's not that give and take that we have in the communication. And so many times the recipient will misread the cues. Uh, you might have thought you were being very polite, but it comes across as terse and perhaps even rude to the recipient. Doesn't mean that you weren't polite. It doesn't mean that the recipient was wrong. It just means that email is really bad at communicating that kind of thing. So when you want to have a difficult conversation or you need to have a difficult conversation, email is a really, really bad tool for that. Don't rely upon that. Send me an email and say, hey, we need to talk. And that's going to result in something that's a lot quicker, a lot less likely to go off the rails. Another thing email is bad about is a generalized question, kind of a vague thing. I'm just not getting 
a consideration. I just don't really understand what it's about. Can you explain it to me? It's a great question, and I'm glad to spend as much time as we need to to get you to the point that you understand consideration. But there's a whole chapter in the textbook about it, and I have a whole lecture on it. If I haven't been able to communicate that to you through that chapter and through the lecture, me sending an email isn't going to work what we probably need to do is do a back and forth because you probably have this very specific question. Maybe you can't even quite form it yet, but there's one particular thing about consideration that's throwing you for a loop. And so I'll say something, then you'll say something back. Okay, I understand this is the part that's confusing. Well, no, that's not quite right. Okay, and we go back and forth. That's the way we get to the information you want. The back and forthness that we need to answer the big questions, the subtle questions, the amorphous questions, doesn't work with email. Um, even, even though we can email repeatedly back and forth, there's going to be so much lag. People are going to forget what was said before. It just doesn't work. It's not an efficient way of getting you to the answer. So focus email on one of two things in this course. Setting up a time that we can talk. That's a good approach. Or second, when you have a very, actually three, three things. Setting up a time to meet or talk. Number one. Number two, a very discreet question. A good rule of thumb is, can the recipient answer that question in three or few sentences? Three, uh, or can the recipient uh, find the answer and send it to you in five minutes or less? If those are true, that's a good topic for a question email. Or finally, an information email, providing information to somebody. Um, Again, uncontroversial information. Dear Professor Groover, I'm going to be late to class on Thursday. I've got a job interview, and I'm not sure when I'll get out of it. I will be sure to get notes from someone in class. Thanks so much. That would be a great email. Here's a breakdown of the grades. This is also available on the syllabus. Um, the discussion board is worth a total of 5% of the grade. It's probably the, the easiest points to get, but you will need to complete those in the weeks that they're assigned. And so probably the biggest uh, opportunity for missing it is to forget about a discussion board or to forget about the particular requirements that we have for discussion boards. And I'll talk about those in a couple minutes. Then we have assignments. Assignments are, um, there will be a, an opportunity to score 32 points. So it'll be, even though you can earn 32 points, it will be out of 30 points. You have the opportunity for extra credit points. Um, answering some questions online. The neat thing about these assignments is that I, the due date for them is the Sunday before the final examination. So you can wait until the very, very end to do this. Um, I don't encourage you to wait. I hope that you'll do them every week as we go forward, but you do have that opportunity. Because I have a due date that is so late into the semester, I am not able to reveal the answers to the assignments on Canvas. However, if you complete an assignment and you want to see what you missed, um, no worries, just come to the office hours virtual or face-to-face -face and we can go through all of those answers and get you what you need. We will also have chapter quizzes. Um, these chapter quizzes you do need to do uh, during the week that you do the discussion board. We don't have a discussion board every week, but the same week we're doing the assignment, we do the chapter quizzes. So that you will need to go ahead and complete. Um, and then we all have a midterm and a final examination. So here's a, a guideline as to what is going on in the semester. We'll talk about the password quiz in a couple of minutes. Uh, so let's save that one for later. You'll watch the video lectures. Sometimes I do the whole lecture in one sitting. Sometimes I might have two or three sittings for a particular lecture, kind of dependent upon my schedule and how long the lecture was going to be. Uh, be sure to watch all of those. Take notes. Treat it just as you would a lecture in a traditional situation. You need to be sure that you're writing down everything uh, that is that is available. You'll also have access to the PowerPoint, so you don't, don't need to feel like you have to write down what is on the PowerPoints. Um, if there are questions that you have, you'll want to um, put
put those in the questions for the instructor discussion board. You can email them to me if you feel like your question is just something you have and not something that would generally be a question others would have. But if you think it's something more general, then be sure to post your own questions for the instructor. Um, there may be other videos or other material in the module in addition to the textbook, of course, which you'll, you'll want to read, which I guess maybe I didn't include that on here. And read textbook, let me just add that. Um, you'll want to dis participate in the discussion board. You'll make two posts at least. Some people like to do more, but you only need to do two. Your first one, which will be the substantive, the meaty one, and then one reply post. You want to complete the assignments. Again, you can wait to do this, but you um, probably shouldn't. You know, obviously, in a particular week, you might be swamped with work and want to wait. But um, most of the time, hopefully, you'll plan on doing the assignment that same week. You do have to take the chapter quiz that week. Uh, you want to prepare the vocabulary. This is a vocabulary intensive course. I like to think about this course, and really most of the course in the paralegal program, kind of like a, a French or a Spanish or a Japanese course. It's not intellectually hard for the most part, but what it is, is there's a lot of stuff to learn. Um, I don't speak any Japanese other than, I guess, kamikaze and arigato or something like that. Um, but uh, whatever the word for door is in Japanese probably doesn't sound anything like um, the word door in English or puerto in Spanish or something like that. So, um, when I see that Japanese word, unless I've studied it, I'm not going to have any idea that that's the word for door. I might be Stephen Hawking level of brilliance, and I'm still not going to know. The only way I'm going to learn that is learning it. And so that's kind of the way our stuff is. Is it hard? Not especially. But does it take time? Absolutely. You can't learn this stuff the night before the final. Um, our brains don't work that way. To transfer things from short-term memory to long-term memory is largely a function of our brains at night, at sleep. And so if we study the night before our final and we go to sleep, we're only giving ourselves one sleep, eight hours, to move all that stuff from short-term to long-term memory. And much better to, to allocate that same amount of time that we would have studied that evening over several days because you'll have lots of sleeps. So we might have only spent, say, uh, eight hours preparing for the test, but we will have maybe 10, uh, 10 sleeps. We will, number one, uh, remember much more for the test. We will retain that memory longer, which of course is especially important for the midterm because our final exam is cumulative, so we don't have to relearn that stuff. And it's a much less unpleasant undertaking. Studying for 30 minutes or 40 minutes a day isn't fun, but it's not nearly as horrible as spending, you know, six or seven hours a day to, to do it. So be kind to yourself, study smarter rather than longer. Also, you'll see that there's grammar stuff in most chapters. Uh, you may wonder, well, why do we have grammar stuff in this course? Well, the reason is that we're learning how to draft parts of contracts as well. And so grammar issues are really, really important in contract drafting. And so we're getting you comfortable with some of those concepts and what those rules are. I'll be honest with you. The grammar questions make up about 10% of the midterm of the final. So it's not a huge part of the grade, um, but it's by far the most commonly missed questions. Uh, most students by the end of the semester, if they've been paying attention, are gonna get vast majority of the contract questions correct. But um, that's not gonna get you the A. You also need to know the grammar stuff to get an A. And so, please, please spend some time on this. I think the grammar questions are a little bit deceptively difficult because I think many times people watch the videos and go, oh yeah, I got that. I already knew that. I learned that in, you know, 10th grade or something. Yeah, you probably did learn it in 10th grade and yeah, you probably do know it, but uh, you need to practice it. You need to refresh yourself on it because with test anxiety, with having answered lots of other questions, 
uh, you may it may not spring to your mind the way that you're hoping it's going to so take that part a little bit more seriously than you might be tempted to the midterm you will take the midterm at a Collin testing center I will drop it off at the Frisco testing center the Frisco testing center is in the uh, founders hall on the second floor above the bookstore if you've never taken a test there, you will need your college-wide ID. They will not accept your driver's license as identification. You won't need a Scantron or a pencil, uh, but you will want to check the um, testing hours for that particular testing center. Um, they will have um, uh, their hours posted on Canvas, or you can call them up and ask them for their hours. Uh, they generally have pretty wide open hours Monday through Thursday. They are not open Friday um, late afternoons and evenings. They're not open Saturday nights, and they're not open at all on Sundays. Uh, they do not allow you to begin a test during the last hour they're open either. So those are some things to keep in mind. Now, I will drop the test off at the Frisco Testing Center, but I will also make it available for the Plano and the McKinney campuses. But <laughs> um, I've done this for enough years that I have seen that sometimes it works seamlessly, and the other testing centers absolutely get, do get information about the test. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, I don't know what goes awry, um, but it sometimes doesn't happen. So if you plan on taking the test anywhere other than the Frisco campus, you need to call ahead to confirm it's there. And don't wait to the last day. I call several days earlier, maybe on the first day. Even if you're not planning on taking it that day, call to see if they have it. Because if they have it on the first day, when you decide to come in on the third day, they'll still have it. Um, if they don't have it, here's, here are some pieces of advice, and I encourage you to write this down if you're thinking about doing this. The first is ask them to look a second time. In my experience, most of the time the testing center has it, they just don't know they have it. Maybe you're dealing with a student assistant who doesn't usually uh, see these types of requests. Uh, so sometimes it requires a little bit more urging, well, you know, I actually my, my instructor's on the Frisco campus. It would have been faxed to y'all. Maybe there's a different place you're storing it, something along those lines. That may be all you need to clarify the issue. A second strategy is if they really don't think they have it is ask them to contact the Frisco Testing Center because I promise you when I submitted it, I requested that it be available to the campuses. So they can call the Frisco campus. The Frisco campus will pull it up. They'll say, oh, yeah, it does show that y'all should get it. We'll resend it to you. Problem solved, right? Okay, that's a, a second strategy you can do. A third strategy you can do is you can call the Frisco Center yourself and say, hey, I contacted the Plano campus or the McKinney campus or whatever one you are going to, and they don't seem to have it, but my instructor said it was supposed to be available. Would you be able to resend it to that campus? So those are three approaches you can do. If those don't work out, you're welcome to reach out to me, but there's a caveat here. I'm not going to be available over the weekends. Most weekends I go off to a place where I do not have internet um, service, and so I won't get your, your text or your email or your telephone call or anything like that. I won't even get the calls from the testing centers because, again, I just don't have a cell phone reception out there. Um, or I may be in class or something along those lines. And so um, I, relying upon me to be able to do it quickly is not going to be um, that productive a path for you. So you're welcome to take it in other places, but just keep in mind you, you will need to be a little bit more proactive if things don't work smoothly. And hopefully it's just there waiting for you and you don't do any of that stuff. So that's one way to take the midterm and the final examination. But there's another way, which is ProctorU. Um, with ProctorU, you can take the test in your own uh, residency. Um, there are Lots of good things with ProctorU, and for lots of folks, it is the best choice to uh, take when you're taking the uh, midterm or final examination. But there are some things to keep in mind. First of all, ProctorU is, does involve an expense to you. It's anywhere, I think, from about $10 to maybe $40, depending upon the length of time that um, you plan on taking. Uh, the midterm is, is shorter than the final. The final has about 100 questions. Uh, so probably for the final, you'll be looking at an hour and a half. Maybe with the midterm, you might be looking at an hour. You can look on the schedule to see what the various costs are for ProctorU under those circumstances. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, 
Another thing to keep in mind is that you need a fairly up-to-date computer with a webcam. Uh, you'll want to go and test to see if your computer is com uh, compliant with the requirements of ProctorU. That's a second thing to keep in mind. A third thing to keep in mind is that you um, can't have uh, other people in the room with you. It has to be quiet. No other people can be visible. So if you've got small children, it's not going to save you money. You're still going to need to have somebody watching the kids. Um, you know, maybe if you have teenagers or, you know, 10 year olds or something like that, you can say don't come in unless the house, on, the house is on fire or something and that can work. Um, so those are some things to keep in mind as you consider ProctorU. If you choose to use ProctorU, awesome, great. Just be sure to let me know 10 days before the first day that the test begins. The reason that I asked for this lead time is that both you and I are going to have to do some things to set this up. And this ensures that we have more than enough time to get all that stuff done. If you miss this window, no worries, you can just take it at the testing center. And just because you miss the window for the midterm doesn't mean you're going to miss the window for the final examination. If you know you want to use Proctor, or at least you know you want to explore that option, pause me right now and send me an email. And then we can explore that in more detail. Okay, so we're back. Let's go forward to the final exam. Pretty much the same thing. Same information about the testing center, same information about Proctor. By the way, for the midterm, I typically have a window of about seven days uh, for taking the midterm. So there's lots of opportunities to take it. For the final examination, I'm not always able to offer the whole seven days, but I usually I always include a, a Saturday, and I usually try to do at least five days. So there will be several, several days that you can pick from. Class participation, we already talked about that 5% for participating in the discussion board. We won't have a discussion board every week, but this is participating every week that we do have a discussion board. The deadline for discussion board is going to be 11.59 p.m. on Sunday. It will go away and so you won't be able to put anything there. A discussion board opens on Monday at 12.01 a.m. and then it closes on the Sunday date. To begin your post, you'll click on the reply button at the discussion board and then go ahead and make that first post. So here's some facts about your post. Uh, your post should be at least 100 words long, and you need to end it with a word count. One good way of doing the word count is to, put, to compose it in something like uh, Microsoft Word and then run the word count on that, or you can manually do it. Um, I certainly understand if your count is one or two words off what my count is, but I know how long 100 words looks. And so if you submit something with 90 words, I'm checking it. Um, and if you've stay, if you omitted the list of words, I guess it's not an academic dishonesty issue, but if you say it has 100 words and it really has 90, that's a problem, something I have to report. So please don't put us in that position. Um, just add really, really, really hot or something. Get to the 100 words. If you post something that doesn't have 100 words, then there will be a deduction, but you'll still get some points. If you post something that has more than 100 words, but you leave out the word count, you're going to get, you're going to lose a point for that as well. The reply post, of course, this won't be replying to yourself, but to somebody else, um, should not simply be a, gosh, I loved your discussion board post. It was so smart. Boy, I, I think what you said is great. I mean, you can include that in it, but that's not going to count for the two complete sentences or 40 words. You need to add something to this. You need to talk more about it. You can say you agree, but say why you agree, or you can say that you disagree. In this course, you can work ahead. Um, other than the midterms and the discussion board and the final examination, everything for the course is ready and waiting for you right now. 
if you want to take either the midterm or the final exam earlier, just contact me and I, we can get that done. The discussion boards I don't open early, so it's always possible that if you're going to be incommunicado for, you know, an entire week that you might miss an individual discussion board. Um, but uh, most of the time people are going to have at least some ability to uh, get on their phones and be able to participate in the discussion board. Um, and if you miss a particular discussion board, uh, given the fact that that's only 5% of your overall overall class grade and we have several discussion boards, it's honestly not going to impact your overall average by very much at all. So let's say you have some computer problems, either your internet's unreliable or you don't have an up-to-date computer or whatever the issue is, not a problem. Your tuition pays for you to have access to a computer lab and those computers are pretty close to state of the art. To listen to the lectures, you're going to want to have earbuds or headphones because the person next door to you probably doesn't want to hear my lecture, as exciting and entertaining as we all know they'll be. Um, so don't feel that because you're having some kind of computer problem that you can't fully participate in the class. And again, if you want feedback on your uh, work in your class, feel free to come to my office hours and we can talk at length. Here's some general advice about how to be successful in the course. Um, this, this next slide is really important. Um, my suggestion is to print out slide 34 or maybe to download or take a screenshot of slide 34 or to maybe download this higher, entire um, uh, uh, PowerPoint so you'll have this and you don't want this on canvas because if canvas has gone down you may not be able to get to this. These are some common fixes to problems that come up with canvas. Um, the first thing I like to say is I am not a computer person at all. Uh, so I am not the person who is best position to help you fix things. I'm going to talk about some just common things that come up and how I have been successful at sometimes resolving them. But a real computer person is probably going to be your way, your way of going with respect to this. Um, one thing to do is to consider trying a different browser. Uh, sometimes with um, Canvas I use Firefox and sometimes I use Chrome depending upon the particular thing I want to use it for. So um, and I've heard other people who are more conversant than I will say, yep, that's, the, no, you know, you don't want to use this for this, you want to use this for this. So um, switching browsers can be a good approach. Another thing is to switch computers. It may be something with your computer, uh, some configuration that you have, maybe some sophomore, software that's out of date or some application that's out of date, something along those lines. And again, using the computer lab can be a way of doing that. Sometimes simply just rebooting your computer might solve the problem. And then, this is always good for me, this next one, is asking somebody else to look at it. Sometimes when they look at it, they're like, well, gosh, Groover, why didn't you just click on that? Oh, yeah, now I see it. Um, and that's a good, good, uh, if you're like me, you may need to do that. And finally, contact the eLearning Center. Um, they uh, obviously are much more conversant technologically than I am. Also, they have skills that I don't access to various things as, as administrators of the program. And so sometimes the problem you're having is a real problem that you can't fix and I can't fix, but guess what? These people can. So um, I'm looking forward to a great semester, and um, I thank you for your attention. Now we're going to flip to Canvas, and we're going to spend a little bit of time, hopefully not too long, on the uh, Canvas website. We've already gone through this PowerPoint. Now let's look at the syllabus. I've already downloaded it here, so let's look at it. Um, the withdrawal date for this course, the date by which you can withdraw, is uh, Friday, October 19th. This will be the same date for all 16-week courses in uh, this fall, and so you may want to calendar that. I certainly hope you won't drop this course, but life happens, and sometimes it's a good date to be aware of. Here are my office hours for this semester. You can see I have face-to-face -face office hours Tuesdays and Thursdays in the afternoon in my 
office, which is this room. I also have virtual office hours, uh, Wednesday mornings for the most part. Um, hopefully these times will work for you, but I understand that it may be that these don't work for you, and so I certainly am available by appointment. Most likely we'll want to have Zoom hours by appointment if these hours don't work. Here's how you go about setting up a Zoom. It's super easy. All you have to do here is hit control click, hit that, and go ahead and open. I'm not actually going to open it here. By the way, right now what I'm doing is a Zoom meeting that I'm taping. It's very, very easy to do that. Um, okay, um, if you have difficulties with this though, you can always email me and we'll figure out what's going on there. I've already talked about don't use the Canvas inbox. Um, I do have an office number, but because I'm really only in my office for about, you know, two and a half hours a week, um, I'm not going to get your voicemail. Uh, so send me an email. I'm pretty, pretty compulsive about that. Again, unless it's the weekend when I don't get emails, um, I will respond usually quite quickly. We've already gone over um, the grade assignment here. Um, orientation quiz. You get three chances on this. You need to get a 90 or higher. If you get below a 90, you get a zero on it. So please don't, um, don't, don't do that. And I've gone through uh, the discussion uh, process or discussion board process already. There's just another place to find that same information that I've already talked about. And then here is our calendar. You'll see most weeks we do one chapter um, and we do them generally in the order. The only difference is we cover five before four and we don't cover 16. Um, you're welcome to read 16, but it won't be on any tests. Um, so this is the breakdown. We're gonna have the midterm during this week of October 15th and it's gonna cover these chapters. It does not cover chapter nine. I don't, didn't put chapter nine on it just because if you had questions about it, you might not have time to really get a good answer before you take the midterm. The final examination covers everything. It's cumulative. So it does, other than chapter 16, doesn't cover that. It has less questions on the first eight chapters, but those first eight chapters are um, also on the final examination. Um, so I'm gonna just click on these and show you some other tools that we have here. This gives you, again, some general information about the course, where my office is, some information about uh, tools if you're encountering difficulties. This is a cheat sheet. Please bookmark, or not bookmark this, but uh, keep this in mind. This is what you probably ought to look to every single week to make sure that you've done all the things you need to do. The one thing I'm missing from this list is read the textbook. Um, I think I kind of assumed you'd be doing that, but now that I look at it, I don't actually list that. So certainly be sure to do that. Here's an FAQ. I think I've probably covered these before, so I'm not gonna spend time going over this now. This is a, a case that talks about um, a court that uh, penalized um, a litigant because his attorney missed a due date. So um, if you want an example of what I was talking about, uh, this is an example of, of that phenomenon. If you have a note-taking system that works for you, great, stay with it. But sometimes uh, students, especially students who've been out of school for a while and maybe haven't taken a course recently, recently uh, don't have a note-taking system that they love. Cornell is one of the systems that um, has been kind of scientifically tested to be pretty effective. It's what my children were taught in, in Frisco, or are being taught, I guess, in Frisco ISD. So um, it's something that you may have been exposed to at some point in your life. I'm not suggesting it, but I'm saying if you're looking for one, it's definitely one worth worthy of being considered. You may also want to tinker with it. Maybe some aspects seem good, some aspects don't. Uh, make it your own. The most important system is a system that makes sense to you. 
and so go on from there and experiment with things if you don't have something that doesn't work. This is my effective emails uh, PowerPoint. If you have questions about how to be effective with emails, uh, please refer to this. I'm not going to test you on emails in this course, but again, if you send me an email that doesn't meet these qualifications, it's likely I'll go back and say, hey, here's some suggestions how to make your email better, and um, then you'll send me it back, and it'll be a whole big thing, and you don't want that, and I don't want that. So if you would, just look these over before you send the email. Um, you will find it that the whole thing will probably be a little bit smoother sailing, so to speak. Um, most students in the paralegal program have no plans to go to law school, but, but it's not infrequent that a student will come to me and say, I'm thinking about law school. Tell me about it. Tell me what do I need to do and how do I need to do it. I am delighted to talk with students about law school. Uh, law school can be a very uh, rewarding, satisfying journey. Or it can be a bad fit for certain people and so um, I want that for you if you are uh, in the circumstances that make have that make sense to you I don't want it for you if you're going to end up with lots of debt and not the career that you want so um, please come see me and I'll be happy to share information this is a little PowerPoint that doesn't really help you decide whether you want to go to law school or not but it helps you understand what law schools are looking for when they consider us as students This is a Cougar email forwarding procedure. Um, you don't have to do this by any means, but some students don't really like to use their Cougar mail email, and they would really like all their email consolidated into the personal email. This is a tool that will let you do that. Here are quizlets that we have for the various chapters. And all you have to do to get to is click on this button up here, and it'll take you into Quizlet. And you'll see um, lots of different um, quizlets available. Um, this one by Hannah Duncan. And Hannah is a very, very meticulous student. And so these, I think, are probably going to be very excellent. Some of these other uh, are from people that I don't necessarily know. Sonia Turner is also a very strong, excellent student. She's actually in law school right now. Um, so these are all uh, people to, uh, or th these are, are good summaries for these chapters. But of course, their notes may not be what you need. So it's always a good idea to consider doing your own Quizlets. Let's just open up one of these so we can see what a Quizlet looks like. I'm just going to randomly pick one. So one thing you can do is you can see they'll have terms with their definitions. That's how most Quizlets are. You can do the traditional flashcards, or you can do one of these others tools. They even have a couple of game type things. The tool that I recommend that you use for the most part is going to be the test, especially once you've gotten pretty comfortable with the terminology. So I would click on the test here. Then I would go down here to options, and I would change this to multiple choice and true false only. And then I would create a new test, and you can go down and test yourself. These test questions are going to be very, very close to the test questions that I would come up with. So if you can do well on these, it's a good chance you'll do well on the test. Now the one thing about quiz that I will say is that as long as you have them in separate chapters, you're just you're just testing yourself on the chapter two terms, the chapter three terms. You know, eventually you're going to want to combine all of these files and have chapters one through eight in one folder so you can uh, be tested on chapter three and chapter two and chapter four, et cetera, et cetera. That will be a more realistic testing experience. You can do that. You can uh, take Hannah's work and, and Sonia's work and other people's works and combine them into a larger folder so you can test yourself and you can add terms, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Anyway, these are just some things to consider. Um, uh, Quizlet would love for you to pay them for this service. In my opinion, there's no reason. It, everything that you need is free. So Quizlet is definitely something worthy of your consideration. There's other tools out there. Uh, if you prefer those, certainly go for them. And this is a good tool really for any college course that involves a significant amount of vocabulary. We have an extra credit opportunity. Please go be sure to do this. Um, this has to do with our LinkedIn program. Let me just go over here for a second and go into LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the place to network on a professional basis. 
Um, and so I highly encourage you to establish a LinkedIn profile. Actually, go on college, paralegal, I'm going to type in college, college paralegal association. This is our group. We have 426 members. We use this primarily for job postings, um, but we are trying to get folks to post other things. So please, when you join, be sure to post um, and to, uh, to establish study groups, to uh, post interesting articles you've seen about the law, all of those things. If you happen to be looking for a job, be sure to post for those or to look for those posts as well and when you see a job post be sure to like it like it even if you don't choose to to apply for that position because that lets me know that a certain number of people have seen this it is very common in this economy that I will hear back from law firms they say how come no one ever contacted us from your uh, college um, you know and, and because there's just so many opportunities out there right now, they may not get a single application from Colin. Um, I mean, it's great that there's lots of opportunities out there, but it's not good for the program when I can't say, well, students are seeing it, maybe your pay is, is out of whack or something along those lines. And so I'm able to say, well, as I look at the posting, four students have seen it or 16 students have seen it. Um, that type of thing. It helps me keep them interested in making these posts. So please be sure to click on it even if you have no intention of applying for the position. It just lets me market the program a little bit better. So in order to get these five points of extra credit on your final examination, you'll need to have a, uh, let me go back, you'll need to have a profile set up. It's free. Let me just pick somebody's profile here. I'm going to click on um, a faculty member here. So you'll set up a profile like this listing various professional uh, things and then you'll want to join the Collin College Paralegal Association. Now when I click on it I am immediately sent into our group but it is a closed group so you won't see this unless you're already a member. So you will need to request membership as long as I recognize your name, you know, or I can look you up and see that, yes, she or he is a Collin College paralegal student, I will be glad to let you join the group. Um, if you can't figure out how to make that request, there's an alternative path. You can friend me or link with me. Um, so let me just type in something. Let's see. So I'm, I'm in my account, so I'm going to just type in, we'll type in Bob Smith. Here we go. I don't know this gentleman. If I wanted to connect with them, I would click on connect and I would send him an invitation. If you send me an invitation, and again, you're one of my students or you're part of the Colin program, um, I will be glad to link with you. And then just send me a note saying, hey, can you send me an invitation to join Colin College Paralegal Association? Um, I can't send invitations to people to whom I am not linked. And so once we're linked, I can send you an invitation. If you want to, you can unlink from me at that point, or you can stay linked, whichever. Those are two ways to join. You absolutely don't have to link with me. You certainly can if you want to. Your decision with respect to that. Okay. This is optional. You don't have to do this. And here's that questions for the instructor. So let's say as you're reading the material, you come across a question. This is where you'd click on it. And once you got in here, you would click on reply and you would post whatever your question is. Everyone will be able to see that, so that's a good clearinghouse for that type of thing. Okay, so we're completed with this first category. Now we're going to move on to the contract study aids. I post this um, and um, Many of these things are, this, especially this first one, is really important. I'm just going to show you what this looks like. We'll be looking at this slide lots and lots of times in the course. Um, so that's one that as you're reviewing your material, you'll want to pay attention to. Some of these others, I'm going to be honest with you, um, they may use somewhat different terminology 
or some other uh, ways of looking at things. And so I recommend that you uh, use these with a grain of salt. You don't have to use any of these tools. Uh, they may be helpful for you. They may not, depending upon your circumstances. Here are the grammar things I was talking about before. I'm going to open this up. A couple things to note about this is that we're using a tool called SAT Grammar Boot Camp. Obviously, we're not preparing for the SAT. I don't you can certainly, but there's no requirement that you do so. The reason that they're called SAT Grammar Bootcamp is that the SAT does have a lot of grammar on it. And so because uh, the grammar is pretty uh, straightforward grammar issues, um, it's a good uh, thing for us to use in our class um, to kind of get us introduced to some pretty straightforward grammar issues. And so I recommend that you watch these particular videos, and they're short. Most of them are three to five minutes long. Um, and most of them you'll watch once a week. Uh, there'll be one as assigned each week. If you have points of confusion, gosh, I don't know about this one or that one, or I, didn't, I need more examples, I have various links here of additional things. Some of these links will be broken. This is something I prepared a few years ago, and so you may need to hunt around for things. If you're not getting what you need, though, feel free to send me an email, and I will refer you to some additional uh, links that might be helpful. You can see there's lots of things here to work from. As I say, this is the area of the course that most students come to test underprepared for, so please don't let that be you. You'll see that I also have um, aids within each module on each topic. So now we're ready for the nitty gritty, the actual material that you will be doing in the class. So my first suggestion is to read the chapter in the textbook. The next suggestion is for you to open up the password quiz. You're not gonna take it now, you're just gonna open it up. Okay, so we're gonna open it up. Okay, I'm going to have to leave student view so I can open exact an actual question. So this won't be exactly what yours looks like, but you'll see that there is typically one, two, one or two, maybe three questions. And you'll see in chapter one, the instructor explains that the common law puts great emphasis upon fairness, predictability, and evolution. In the next slide, she adds that consistency is, and she provides a symbol. That symbol is, and you're going to type it here. So you see what I'm doing is I am putting you in a position that the only way you can be successful in getting this quiz is by actually um, uh, answering these questions. And you need to get these answers correct in order to have access to the chapter quiz and to the assignment. And the, and the next question is, in chapter one, the instructor discusses the use of horn books. She explains that there exists a series of horn books available in the Spring Creek Library. These books are about the size of paperback books and are relatively inexperienced. They are part of the blank shell series. And I have um, various choices here to uh, uh, let you complete that. Okay, so, um, that is that. So you'll want to watch, you want to know what the questions are you have to answer before you watch the lecture. Because if you don't, when you're watching the lecture, you may miss whatever it is that, you know, because you're thinking about some other tasks. So you'll, you'll find out what the questions are, then you'll go and watch your lectures. You can see here there are two lectures to watch. This is the PowerPoint I'll be using in the lecture. So this is a good source for note, note taking. Lots of students like to have this open or printed out and then they write their notes on it so they don't have to actually duplicate what's on the PowerPoint. I have this particular PowerPoint in PDF form. I give instructions at the end of the course into the PowerPoints how to convert if you want more of your PowerPoints in PDF format. Um, and then here is the discussion board. The dis first discussion board is introductions. I give you an example of an introduction you might make and I give you an example of a reply. To begin that process, you click on reply and you type in your material there.
then this is that the that grammar boot camp thing and then here is the grammar questions to complete after watching this and I also provide the key again this isn't for an assignment this is just to help you uh, test yourself and to practice those skills knowing it intellectually without practicing it isn't always as successful so you'll want to use these materials and each week and review them before you take the relevant test once you pass the password quiz then you will get access to these two documents now this first one you can see it's not due until december 9th um, so you have a lot of time to this one this one will show though the date that uh, we have for the discussion board so this will be september 2nd i don't actually have that entered in here so this one is time sensitive so if you uh, want to take the quiz and of course you will because that's a grade you will be want to be sure to watch the lectures so you can answer the password question so you can be successful on the quiz this one you can wait on although i don't recommend that you do so if you have any technical problems navigating this area, please contact me early in the week because, again, I'm not going to be here over the weekend and, and the deadlines for everything in this course is going to be 11.59. Well, everything but tests. So uh, discussion boards, assignments, quizzes are going to be 11.59 p.m. on Sunday. The rest of the chapters are going to go in this same pattern. Sometimes there will be some additional items in the folder. Be sure to look at those. Those are assigned as well. At this point, I think I've covered everything that we need for the orientation. Um, as always, look for announcements too. Let me just flip over here so you can see what I talk, I'm talking about when I'm talking about announcements. I have two that I'm about to release. You probably have already gotten the welcome to contracts. You'll be getting this email soon. Uh, typically, in an online course, I send an email, one or two emails early in the week. And if I think an issue comes up that uh, would benefit students to get some additional information, I may send additional email so be on the lookout for those it is very much a pleasure to be teaching this course I very much hope that we have it and I know we will have a successful semester thank you for your attention bye bye